other financial managers are struggling to obtain the right information and increase automation and collaboration in a timely and cost-effective manner. In today's webinar, you'll learn how other organizations who faced outdated infrastructures or inefficient processes made the transformation to world-class financial operations. Hi, I'm Brian Dietz, and I'm president of Britain's Fruit Systems, and I'll be your host today for the next 45 minutes. Prior to joining Britain Fruit Systems, I actually was a CFO at two different organizations. One was a Kodak subsidiary, as well as a CFO for a government contractor. So I've experienced some of the things that several of you on the, the call today have experienced. Joining me today also will be Tony Cantor. Tony is an associate director with our enterprise performance management practice. And Tony, can you take a few minutes to talk about your background and experience? Sure, Brian. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Tony Cantor, and I've been implementing ERP and ERP-related systems for the better part of 25 years. Uh, having implemented financial, human resources, and learning systems, I've worked with organizations of all sizes across many industries. Currently, I manage our team of EPM implementers here at Brittenford, and I'm pretty excited to uh, share some of what we've learned along the way and as we've uh, assisted organizations in simplifying some of their business challenges. Brian? Great. Also joining us today is Shelia Thompson, and she is the controller with the National Basketball Players Association. And later on in the webcast, Shelia will be sharing some of her recent experiences of how the National Basketball Players Association recently transformed their financial management operations. Welcome, Shelia. Hi. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be on the call. I'm very excited. Great. This is supposed to be an interactive webcast, so if you do have questions, please ask them during the presentation. On your uh, menu bar with the uh, GoToWebinar, there's a place where you can click on the Q&A tab, and then you can ask your questions, and I will be moderating those questions, and I'll get to make sure that Tony or Celia answers those. Today's webinar is being hosted by Brittenford Systems, and at Brittenford Systems, we help organizations simplify business challenges. We implement train and support a variety of different solutions. I'm from the financial management uh, solutions, we do Intact, uh, Dynamics GP, and Dynamics SL. As far as enterprise performance management, we work with host analytics. We also do strategic infrastructure consulting, data integration, reporting and analysis, application development, and also temporary accounting staffing. The agenda for today's webcast is really to cover uh, four main areas, kind of talk about the current state of affairs for CFOs and what they're facing today. Talk about how cloud is transforming things. Hear a little bit about how the National Basketball Players Association in particular handles some of that transformation. And finally, to talk a little bit about if you're looking to make that transformation, what are the steps that you need to do? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony. And he'll start going through the first topic. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, when we talk about the current state of affairs for CFOs, what we're really talking about is the the challenges and the forces that they have to deal with and, and uh, how they deal with some of those particular challenges and forces. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few of them. So in 2016, finance leaders still live with these constant pressures, you know, starting off with lack of accurate information. We've heard all the stories about nearly 88% of all spreadsheets contain an error or more, and you know, our staff's in such a great rush to get us the numbers as quickly as possible. So often what happens is they forget one small piece of the puzzle, and that problem cascades through every product they produce. It's frustrating for them. It's potentially devastating for us. We get analytics without explanation. You know, perhaps a footnote is missing. We get new headers on columns without understanding where the numbers came from. We get pretty graphs that leave assumptions on our part. I mean, we're finance. We're supposed to be the ones making the assumptions, not leaving others with uh, assumptions to guess about. And then we have just the opposite situation. We have lack of visuals. Um, many of the organizations we work with bombard their leadership with data when a well-crafted note or even a, a picture will speak a thousand words. And then risks. You know, what can we say about risks and their impacts? Do we know? Do we understand what the risks are and what those impacts to those risks are? Do we understand the all of us just to be more reactionary. We can certainly be uh, proactive enough. It's like cost. You can never improve cost enough. 
Uh, still, I'm sure many of us feel like we're too reactionary as we work, try to work through things and anticipate. One of the directives I give my team all the time is, is to anticipate everything. And of course, talent. Uh, talent, both acquiring and retaining talent, is always a force to reckon with. I find it interesting to note that we are currently trying to hire six generations of individuals in our workforce and motivated by something different. For example, we have millennials. Millennials are attracted to technology and forward-thinking organizations that are on a mission. You know, the notion of temporary is, is not foreign to them. They're, they're actually very adaptable and certainly more, uh, more accepting of change than, say, somebody like myself who's a baby boomer. Um, looking at some of these challenges, let's, let's go a little further and see uh, how some of these challenges play out. Uh, Excel. For example, Excel is here to stay. So everything you've heard about the end of spreadsheets, uh, that's certainly premature. But what we are finding, at least in the EPM space, is that we're seeing more and more organizations move beyond Excel uh, as a desire driven for timeliness of the numbers that they need. Uh, data collection with regard to uh, surveys of finance professionals. And that more than 25% of finance teams spend more than half their time collecting, entering, and validating data. That is an enormous amount of operational time lost. As I spoke about earlier, we get numbers and tons of numbers that, without any understanding of their origin. And learning. Learning is always going to be at the forefront of what we do in our businesses simply because technology and processes are changing so quickly that our employees need to learn at a faster rate. This forces the need for easily adopted tools. Fortunately, a lot of cloud applications are easily adopted. Uh, with regard to planning and budgeting, uh, we're never going to automatically do, the tools that are out there will never automatically do for us what our brains can do. However, we're way beyond Y2K, and we have the opportunity now to create models and really synthesize a lot of what happens in our business inside one application. Uh, and then, of course, with regard to business alignment, uh, businesses are not always going to be in sync with each other, but through collaboration and collaborative tools, we have the opportunity to be that business partner finance executives are expected to be in both 2016 and beyond. So let's look a little more specifically at the CFO's highest level challenges. I've broken them out into four of them. First one is budgeting and planning challenges and looking at the impact of the CFO and, and on finance. When we look at the characteristics that surround budgeting and planning challenges, we see that we have a weak authentication of the process that sources the numbers. Uh, sometimes the processes take too long. Uh, our approval processes are clumsy. They're unstructured. We have a lack of comparison scenarios. Maybe we can only source one year of actuals. We maybe can't go back five years. Maybe we can't look at a preloaded budget versus a, a forecast into the future. Um, we have a lack of a clear communication of assumptions. So, so what does all this mean for a CFO's office and finance in general? What it means is that loss of trust, a loss of credibility, and a loss of insight. When we look at the second thing we deal with, it's poor modeling. Uh, as I spoke about at the beginning of the presentation, spreadsheets we find are filled with errors. We get versioning and blaming issues. You know, I didn't put those numbers in there. Finance must have done it. So this really speaks to the need for for version control and for a secure budgeting process. We don't know what our what-if capabilities are. You know, can we put together models that take into account variables that are outside of my chart of accounts? Can I spin revenue models or sales models 50 different ways? Uh, we have a lack of organization-wide scenario planning. Again, playing off that shared experience of budgeting, finance, and uh, simply sharing in the problem instead of being the owner of the problem. Uh, certainly, finance can share in the pain, but finance shouldn't solely bear it. So what does all this translate into? It translates into a loss of integrity, a loss of collaboration, and a loss of vision. Uh, carrying along with our theme, the third challenge we see CFOs dealing with is a lack of skilled planning and planners. I repeat this because it's so important for the effectiveness of a CFO's organization. Uh, I talked earlier about the need for continuous learning. This really goes back to the type of culture that we foster in our organization. Um, once again, millennials, they love organizations that force learning. They love change, and they're easily adapt, uh, adoptable. And so what else happens when we, we struggle with resources and, and uh, trying to get our resources integrated into our operations? 
we, we have difficulty managing budget calendars. And we know we're always on tight deadlines, so we have difficulty moving through the budgeting and planning process. So ultimately, with a lack of skill in our organization and a lack of insight, it leads to loss of time, loss of productivity, and loss of efficiency. Finally, experience disjointed processes and integrations. Um, I'm going to go a little deeper with this one, but uh, first I want to talk a little bit about disjointed processes and integrations. Um, I review a lot of applications with a lot of organizations, and I find that they're constantly looking for new tools to solve their problems when the opportunities within changing processes and improving processes are left alone. You know, they say we don't have time. We don't, uh, we don't have time to rework our processes or we, uh, we struggle to find the best practice. We do a, an internet search anywhere on any process being done in any sort of business and there's probably a list of best practices that can be adopted pretty quickly. Uh, and you certainly want to work toward those disjointed uh, processes and integrations because ultimately that's where you're gain, going to gain incredible efficiencies. Um, so I'm going to take this a little further, as I said earlier, and introduce a new model to you. Um, with regard to disjointed process, you have a loss of vision and loss of vision control. Uh, that will be a constant theme as you, as you work through any type of transformative or transformation into the future. So as I said, I want to talk a little bit about people, technology, and processes. As I've been working in this space for several years, I, I keep hearing the, the term people, technology, and processes. You've got to improve the people, the technology, and the processes. And I think that's fine, but I think that really underscores or undersells what we're really trying to accomplish. And instead, I'd like to introduce a new paradigm to you. And that is this concept that it's really processes, technology, and integrations all working together to support the individual. I mean, after all, people have to manage all of these concerns. So with regard to that new model and that new paradigm, carrying on, let's look a little bit about how we pursue our best practices and what we may look for as we transform through a potential application. Well, the first thing we want to look at is we want to look at performance reporting, make sure that it's available to smartphones and tablets. We're working in a mobile world. We're all expected to be on 24-7, and we want to ensure that we have the portability of our favorite devices. Uh, we have access anywhere. Playing off that theme, we want to ensure that we have the capability to be connected on demand. We don't want to wait until Monday if an idea hits us on a Friday or Saturday. We certainly don't want to wait until the morning if an idea hits us after 5 p.m. Um, also, we want to ensure that our, we can track our transactions and make sure that we're actually monitoring the status of things and not throwing our transactions into a process flow and hoping they show up two days later only to find out that our transaction went somewhere into the ether. And of course, we want to become finance independent. We want to take back some of that overhead from IT. And we want to solve our own problems in our own time. A few years back, I was upgrading an application, actually an EPM application for an organization. And the director of IT came up to me and I thought he was going to tell us we did a good job. And he told us, he did actually tell us we did a good job. And he was telling us that uh, Everything went really well. You managed a good process and all that. And I kind of smiled, and then he paused for a second. He said, now get that thing off my servers immediately. And I was completely stunned. I was like, I couldn't believe that IT didn't want responsibility for our finance applications. But come to find out, IT has a lot more things on their plate than certainly managing our applications. So anything we do to embrace technology and bring more of that for our own independence within finance certainly is a win for not only finance but for IT as well. And then of course familiar user interface. When we work with clients uh, at the beginning of all of our projects, we ask our clients, what defines success for you? What would it mean for you all to be successful? And nearly every time one of them lists that they would like their users to have a good experience an easy experience, and a very easily adoptable experience. Um, and then with regard to uptime, 99.9% uh, .9 SLA, you want to have an application with really high uptime. Fortunately, all best of breed applications like, like Intact and Host have made this type of uh, property or capability standard for their applications. 
along with regard to the transformation for process improvement and keeping in mind what our best practices, you know, you want to center on the pursuit of your vision. I had spoken earlier about vision control and, and losing that vision. This is where you want to really take hold of that, that vision and think about tomorrow. Today's history, you can't worry about anything that's going on today, but you can put a stake in the ground someplace in the future and certainly work toward that. With regard to the simplification of your chart of accounts, you know, wherever possible, as a primary initiative, you want to make sure that you simplify your chart of accounts. Because this impacts every downstream process that you will eventually use. You want to start with the end in mind and certainly work your way back to what you think your chart of accounts really needs. This reduction in, in uh, transaction cycle times. It's not just about the reports that you put out, but it's about how you collect the data and how you source the data from other systems. All of these are candidates for possible improvement in your transformative or transformation into the future. Um, with regard to process management and data integrity, don't put the cart before the horse. Data integrity comes from well-executed and well-managed processes. Uh, with regard to secure distribution, pursue secure distribution, not just in the data you disseminate, but also in the data you collect. And with regard to HR capital planning, uh, finally, I, I work with companies that have fantastic operating expense models. And then it comes time to their HR and capital planning, and they're off in some remote spreadsheet somewhere. You don't have to work with things like that. Applications like Host have pre-built connectors and pre-built modules that can store all of this type of information in one centralized database and immediately make it possible to integrate it with your operating and capital expense uh, budget. So Tony, before you move forward, I've got a couple sure. of questions that have come in really just about some logistics. Uh, if you are interested in receiving CPE credit for today's presentation, just put a note in the chat window and I'll make sure that uh, we get that certificate out to you. Back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with regard to cloud transformation, you know, we all hear a lot of cloud this and cloud that, and really for all its simple, for all its fancy terms, uh, cloud is really simply on-demand, internet-based computing using shared resources. This little diagram simplifies things a little bit for you. Uh, touching on some of the things I've spoken about previously, one of the things that I really like to emphasize is that the cloud is here to stay. The cloud's been around for probably 17 years in, in many forms and fashions, uh, but it is, it is an, uh, the technology that is becoming more and more adopted every day and every year. I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second. Um, with regard to some of the properties related to, crop, to cloud transformation, you, you've got a secure uh, environment. It's uh, becoming more secure and becoming believed to be more secure every year. You've got anytime, anyone, anywhere capabilities. You know, you're always on 99% of the time. You've got tier four data centers, backup facilities, and uh, organizations that build these cloud applications with more infrastructure to support their apps than any traditional inter internal IT organization might have. You've got uh, disruption, not necessarily in a bad way, but in an innovative way, meaning that things that we can do Today, we can do better and differently than we've ever been able to do them before. Uh, strategic, the cloud is allowing us to build more and more models into a centralized cloud-formed database so that we can invite more and more organizations within our enterprise into our responsibilities in finance. And then, of course, finance independence. I spoke about that earlier. There's no large overhead and there's no big application to maintain, that's all being done in a remote site somewhere else. So when we talk about transformative applications, we, we look at some of the things we should be looking for. With regard to scale and cost, uh, you know, cloud computing is scalable because the architecture of true cloud computing is to be multi-tenant. And what that means is that more and more clients are sharing the same physical resource. There's virtually no limit to storage. And ultimately, what that translates into is better savings with regard to physical maintenance as well as any hidden cost you may incur with any upgrades. Uh, again, uh, clouds have on-demand pricing. It's an efficient provisioning system that allows it possible to make 
uh, cloud applications deliver to customers much less ex uh, expensively than current uh, applications are being done. Uh, you have encapsulated change management. I touched on this earlier with regard to models, but it's ultimately the ability to take all of your strategic initiatives and wrap them all within one architecture. With regard to next generation architecture, you're uh, beginning to blur the lines between personal computing and enterprise computing. We all know how to enter, uh, move around on the internet and navigate. Cloud applications are approaching that level of sophistication where they're almost self-directing and intuitive and allow our users to quickly adopt them. Uh, with regard to choice and agility, uh, this really again speaks to that finance independence. You could actually have uh, agility with standard IT implementation practices. However, that would be very expensive. You'd need a lot of IT infrastructure and a lot of finance resources to deal with all of the challenges and threats that you might have to deal with. So with regard to cloud architecture and cloud applications, you can remove a lot of that and still maintain your choice and agility that you'd expect from, from larger infrastructures. And then, of course, at a micro level, you want to be able to have performance reporting, reliability that I touched on earlier, as well as that user-friendly uh, interface that is secure. Uh, when we look at transformative processes and what to look for with regard to those, uh, simplified structures, you want to be able to simplify your chart of accounts and you want to be able to re represent them in any tool that your organization utilizes. You want to simplify not only the reports that you create, but also simplify the distribution of those reports. You want to automate wherever possible and push the adoption uh, of acquiring them out to your workforce. Uh, with regard to distribution, you want to pursue strategies that distribute whatever you're distributing, templates, reports, data, in a secured framework. And uh, you want to emphasize processes over formulas. Here, you really need to emphasize that the process will ultimately drive what the formula should be. So often we work on our formulas and we get our formulas right only to find out that we have the wrong formulas in place in the first place. So certainly drive the process and from the process, the formulas and what the data needs to look like will evolve and show itself. Um, and then of course, increased collaboration. This is probably my favorite aspect of a transformation and what we see happen. I've worked in finance in and out in many capacities over the last 30 years, sometimes as a financial analyst, sometimes as a financial consultant, but oftentimes as somebody outside the organization, inside the company, supporting finance. And what I found is that there's this tendency to kind of dump on finance, to kind of throw things over the wall and give it to finance. I don't think there's any malicious intent here. I think what's happening is that uh, there's just this belief that once finance has it, finance will be okay with it. And what I like about cloud applications and what's really good about the opportunities with cloud applications is that you can spread the responsibilities out. You can really push out collaboration and really allow the organizations that own those numbers to get involved in the financial processes and responsibilities immediately. And you can keep them in. Um, and then, of course, within all of that, the micro level, you want to push toward processes that are adopted quickly using simplified, flexible, and easily comprehensible tools. Tony, you got a question from Brittany. Um, sure. There's a lot of talk about cloud and uh, legacy systems or on-premise systems being cloud-enabled. Are, are they the same as these cloud computing systems, or are there differences? There are definitely some differences. Uh, there, there are ways to take premise applications and make them cloud. A lot of times what happens is those applications are not necessarily multi-tenant. They're single tenant. And what that means is that you will also experience those upgrade issues and perhaps some overhead issues as you go through your implementation processes. It's not uh, you don't get that seamless upgrade and that seamless uh, implementation that you currently experience with a multi-candidate application. Okay. Uh, any other questions? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So with regard to the cloud and, and the advantages that get passed along to clients, what do we see those as? Well, with regard to anytime, anywhere access, you get a mobile workforce that's always enabled. Uh, with regard to seamless upgrades, which I actually just mentioned a minute ago, you get less disruption to the workforce. 
And one of the things I really like uh, is the speed of deployment. Um, I worked back in the days of the PeopleSoft and a lot of the other real hardy ERP applications. Sometimes it took us two to four years to put a, a financial system in. We're putting in our EPM system now in, in three to four months. And with regard to that speed of deployment, customers get the return of their day jobs sooner. Uh, increased collaborations allow us to shift that responsibility to where it ultimately belongs. Uh, with regard to known subscription costs, companies can now plan out their CapEx and OpEx expenses all along the way. You don't have busted servers you're trying to replace halfway through the year. Um, all of your subscription costs can be budgeted at the beginning of the planning year, and you'll know them for the entire year. Um, with regard to finance independence, once again, taking off that responsibility from IT and shifting that uh, capability of IT to become more productive and away from the support that they currently have to do with regard to supporting us. And then, of course, dedicated service and uh, uh, security and service levels, immediate compliance, immediate support, and data protection. Uh, cloud infrastructure organizations have had to build all of these things immediately into the application so that when you get the application, you immediately have it. You don't have to do more configurations and more you know, implementation costs and overhead in order to meet compliance um, or uh, data protection. Okay, so one of the things to look at cloud with regard to cloud statistics, and I'll, I'll highlight a couple of these. You guys can read through the slides, but I, the first one's really important to me. You know, there's, there's something kind of lost in that statistic. 70% of companies reinvested savings by moving to the cloud. Just the ones that reinvest savings. There's probably many, many more that are actually garnering savings. So the savings from cloud applications is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 plus percent. And then of course with regard to financial strategy, you've got finance executives saying that the cloud is crucial to their organization's strategies. Of course with regard to cloud adoption, You've got nearly 90% of businesses have adopted the cloud in some capacity. There's probably many of you on the phone today who are looking at cloud applications or already have some cloud applications already in your organizations. And then what I really like is the last bullet, and that is with regard to deployment options, cloud is always under consideration for any new deployment going forward. So, talked a lot about uh, cloud and cloud statistics, uh, but still, regarding anything you move forward with, there's always going to be detractors, right? There's always going to be someone objecting to the cloud. And what we found with fo folks objecting to the cloud is really this concept of it's all about resisting evolution, right? There's always going to be something or someone resisting evolution. Well, but we found that those come in five forms. Talent, Skepticism, assumptions, disruption, aversion, and immunity all cause objections to the cloud. Now, we know talent is tough to acquire and retain, especially in the financial space. But we also know that employees are attracted to evolving organizations. And certainly, cloud organizations are evolving organizations. They're forward thinking. And certainly, with the cloud, there's a strong opportunity for mission. Skepticism. It's natural to be skeptical. That's okay. We're all skeptical of things. Um, I'm, I'm probably more of a late adopter than an early adopter. But as I said earlier, the cloud's been here for a, quite a long time. It's here to stay, and it's not going away. Um, I still haven't embraced social media, but I know the day's going to come when I'm going to have to do it. And like the cloud, uh, probably better to have done it sooner rather than later. Um, assumptions, you know, with regard to whether this will really work for our organization. You know, we've always done it a certain way. Why do we need to change? Well, really change is the only way to improve your current circumstances. So changing is going to come uh, whether you want it to or not. Uh, disruption or version, uh, better now than later. Um, disruption or version is natural, not a problem. It takes time and time to plan and time to follow through. But once again, it's coming and you're going to have to find a way to deal with it sooner rather than later. And then, of course, immunity. You know, there's the old, we don't have to change. We don't have to do it this way. We, we've always done it this way. Our way works fine. Well, come in, like I said, and uh, things are not going to be able to be done tomorrow the way you do them today. If you look at any other industry, you'll see how you've been forced to adopt and to adapt in order to support that industry. And like the, size, uh, like the slide says, uh, resistance is fuel. 
Um, so in the end, what it really comes down to is that there's always a better mousetrap. So um, we've talked a little bit about transformation, how transformation, the current state of affairs for CFOs, and we talked about cloud transformation. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to talk about transformation to the next level, and we're going to do that by bringing in Shelia Thompson. Shelia is a controller with the National Basketball Players Association, and she and her firm have recently gone through a transformation with their finance department, uh, implementing both Intac, which is an ERP cloud product that improves counting operations, and Host Analytics, which is a corporate performance management tool aimed at improving both their budgeting and planning. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask Shelia a few questions and let her share with you some of the experiences that she and her team have gone through in order to stand up these applications. Good afternoon, Shelia. Good afternoon, Tony. How are you? Um, well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and dive right into it. So um, if you could, please share with the group what uh, the NBPA's single biggest driver towards cloud applications was. There were actually a couple of drivers that led us to uh, cloud applications. Uh, one is our current accounting platform had been reaching its expected life cycle. And we were faced with whether to invest further or seek alternative solutions. Cloud applications has always appealed to us. And one of the reasons why is because we needed visibility into our operations. Um, it was also a cost-effective solution, and we needed something that was scalable because we were going to be undergoing rapid growth and needed a platform that was more adaptable for our operations. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other application benefits you all sought during your transformation? Uh, we needed to make sure that it worked in sync with a lot of our other financial cloud uh, applications that we had currently utilized, so uh, that was another driver towards the cloud app. Uh, so which process has been most positively affected by your transformation, and what has the impact of that transformation been? Well, we definitely feel like we own the platform without having the cost associated with owning the platform. Um, the impact, I would say, independence from our bar with our previous platform, we constantly had to go to our uh, solutions uh, specialist to be able to make any changes. Uh, we can do that here, but it just seems a little bit easier with the cloud application. Thank you. Um, and with regard to both host and intact, you've implemented both of those. Um, what about the cloud made the implementations easier? Well, you're engaged from the beginning of the process. It's going to be very hands-on, and you're going to be involved every step of the way. Uh, one of the things we appreciated is understanding how the system was changing regularly. You could visualize those changes and understand how it relates to your business operation. Thank you. Uh, so what was the greatest challenge you and your team experienced trying to implement the cloud? One of the things that I would say definitely would be our thought process. We had to disassociate the way we previously thought about uh, implementing software with the new cloud-based system. Um, <laughs> you definitely had to change your mindset. And by this, I mean you have to remind yourself that the system is adaptable and not be afraid to build, even if there are going to be changes down the line. Um, I think one of the things we were afraid of is the cost associated with changes given the old model, and we had to disassociate ourselves from that thought process and to just move forward. Oh, that's great. That's great. So are there any other pieces of advice you would want to give to other organizations so that they could either embrace the challenge that you laid out or avoid it completely? Um, to not be afraid of the process, to understand that you are going to make mistakes, along the way, and one of the good things is that you have Bridenford leading the charge. He'll be able to understand your business and help you navigate the process. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any unexpected benefits or benefit that you all received by using cloud applications? 
definitely. We love having insight and visibility into our operations at any place and any time. We do travel twice a year, uh, and our office relocates, so it's very good to know that we have our systems on hand. So if any of our executive directors have questions, we're able to uh, get some information and insight via the report right away as opposed to say, we'll have to wait until we're back in the office and we'll get an answer to you. We'll have that answer. Um, another plus has been the periodic software upgrades. They've been a major plus. It helps to enhance our processes. Great. Uh, and finally, what single piece of advice would you give to any organization considering a move to the cloud? To just be flexible, um, make decisions, and take actions. Um, what we experienced was our internal implementation team and key business decision makers sometimes would hold off making changes, again, because we were afraid of the old model. Don't be. Um, make the change. Change is inevitable, and you should embrace it. Even if you don't know what the end result will be, just go forward. Um, push through. Britain Fred is there to kind of help you <laughs> and assist you through the process. But change is inevitable, so embrace it. Thank you very much, Shaya. So, Celia sharing her story, her insight, and her path toward transformation. I'm sure as you spoke, uh, others were probably thinking about what they might have to go through in order to embrace the same level of change that you and the NDPA went through. Uh, thank you again for sharing that testimony with us. Uh, what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about what you might do or what to consider as sort of a checklist for readiness and some of the immediate actions you may take as you, uh, as you look to the cloud and a possible transformation for your organization. I, I want to consider the processes, the technology, the integrations, and of course the people within those finance organizations. When we look at a checklist for readiness and preparing for the cloud, with regard to processes, we want to identify financial processes for improvement. And really this could be anything, you know, an example, a monthly close, any process from how you collect data to how you disseminate data. Uh, and you want to be able to determine the future of your chart of accounts. Going back on that theme I talked about earlier about, about where you want to be in the future and really putting a stake in the ground for that point in the future and actually driving toward it. Uh, with regard to technology, with regard to cloud applications, there really isn't a lot of technological consideration at this point. You may want to consider what browser you use or what versions of browser and and uh, you may want to look internally at what your mobile applications workforce policies are. But beyond that, the technology of a cloud application is really outside of the organization and, and uh, what you have to immediately consider yourself, uh, concern yourself with. Uh, with regard to integrations, uh, you want to identify all source and supporting systems. You know, an example might be, are you getting your HR data from ADP or are you getting some revenue data or sales data from Salesforce? You also want to determine reporting requirements for all of your connected organizations, not just those reports that you may develop internally for finance or for your financial management, but for any of the organizations you might support. Uh, and you, of course, you want to assess the current cleanliness of your segment data. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about it in a second, but uh, what we find is, is that organizations often don't have their data uh, as clean as they'd like it to be before they start their implementation. And, that can certainly muddy the water uh, for, for an organization as they try to move through a quick, uh, as I said earlier, uh, cloud applications tend to implement pretty quickly. So you want to do anything you can to uh, make that, uh, or not prohibit that, that uh, quick cycle from happening. And then uh, with regarding people, you want to determine your stakeholders for integrations, uh, technologies, and processes. Uh, you want to make sure that you know, if your board of directors needs to be pulled into the loop that, that they are. Uh, the sales VP is definitely going to have some say in, in how certain financial numbers are produced and, of course, the CIO and, and every other leader of the organization. Um, so some immediate actions you might want to take are, are the following. You want to create examples by process of what you want to become. Uh, you want to straighten out your chart of accounts before you implement. Um, clean up your data as a separate connected project. Once again, going back to what I just spoke of, if you wait and try to clean up your data during the implementation, you're going to use a lot of overhead and resources, of consulting resources, that you don't really need to learn. Certainly, organizations like mine can help lead the process of data cleanup, 
but it should really be done as an initiative prior to uh, kicking off your implementation. Um, you want to alert IT of your intentions. Um, they're certainly going to be one, uh, are going to want to be in the loop for any type of application organizations within the company take on. And you want to work uh, through your application provider, application integrator to begin looking at and evaluating opportunities for transformation. With regard to integration, once again, examples. Examples are great when you can actually map out the data relationships between systems uh, that are currently in your organization. You can probably, and this is 25 years of talking, you can probably immediately reduce your implementation cycle by 10% if you can present your implementation team with a map of what your data relationships look like from system to system before the kickoff or before you start implementing. And then finally, with regard to people, you want to capture stakeholder expectations for financial systems transformation. There's always going to be stakeholders inside and outside of finance. The sooner you find what they expect from this new transformation, the sooner you're going to be able to address those issues and build those into either a project plan or to a milestone within the project. Um, so in regard to those actions, in wrapping up and concluding our presentation, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to leave you all with three thoughts and a particular call to action. And the first thing I'd like you to do is to consider every task within finance an opportunity for positive transformation. You to forge alliances both inside and outside of finance in order to investigate those areas towards successful change. And of course, keep an open mind with regard to even the smallest innovation, whether it be changing one report or actually changing an entire process of how you source data. So with that, we'll go ahead and move on to any questions that might be remaining. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to sit with us through your busy schedules today. I'd like to thank Shulia for her thoughts and insights and contributions to this webinar. And of course, Brian for moderating. And with that, Brian, I will go ahead and send things back to you. Well, we do have quite a few questions. So Shulia, you've got some people that want to pick your brain some more. Um, Steve wanted to know from a time frame uh, to implement both you know, a new ERP and a new EPM system, kind of rough time frame that each project take, and was it more or less time than you anticipated? Thanks for that, Brian, and thanks, Steve. Um, as with any implementation, there are going to be um, some challenges, and that speaks back to what I said earlier about um, being flexible and making decisions. Uh, both implementations were completely different. The first is because we were inflexible and we did not make decisions. So to the extent that you do make those decisions more timely, and we were also making a lot of uh, changes in terms of our processes. We were streamlining chart of accounts and um, making essential chart of accounts. So to the extent that you can get those processes uh, completed in advance, the implementation should go pretty smoothly. Uh, you just want to make sure you make any decisions as quickly as possible because it will hold up the time frame. Um, with regard to the host analytics, that actually went faster than we expected because of our experience from the first go route. With host, we made decisions rather quickly. Uh, again, you have Brittenford leading the charge. So they'll be able to walk you through these processes. But again, you need to be flexible, you and your implementation team, and you need, need to make those decisions because that's going to determine uh, how fast or how slow your implementation goes. OK, thank you. Um, a question from Ginger, and this relates to you made a comment about liking these updates. Uh, will, have any of these updates broken things? I guess, and I hear that quite often, where people are concerned about cloud applications with changed. Has that had any impact to you, you know, since you've no. been using these cloud applications? No, I think there was only one time, and we've been using this system for well over a year, there was only one time where we experienced downtime, and that was only for one hour. So, no, uh, you'll go, you'll work on a platform 
one day of module and you'll come in the next day and they'll make enhancements to it and you're like, oh, okay, this is something I really wanted it uh, to be. For example, one of the things is we needed to make changes to departments. Um, rather than doing a reclass entry, we would never be able to make them after a bank rec is done. Now we can change departments at any time. And that was a huge uh, key for us to be able to make changes on the fly like that. So we were happy when we saw that enhancement come through. Okay. But no downtime. Great. And then one uh, final question from Allie. She wanted to know from an executive buy-in perspective, were there challenges as you try to get executives to, you know, the executive director or the CFO to embrace cloud and transformation and just from a business case standpoint or any pointers there? Yes. Um, I would just let them know that the current climate is leaning towards more real-time financials and that the cloud is definitely going to enhance and move your organization towards real-time reporting. A lot of the times uh, key stakeholders are concerned because they're receiving information and it takes a long time. So you definitely want to stress the point that it's going to enhance and be able to give them visibility and potentially real-time visibility into the operations. Um, so they definitely want to consider uh, cloud applications. Once they begin to see it, they'll understand and appreciate. So you have to definitely continue to work with them for value on that. Okay. And Tony, I think we've got a question from you, for you from Tyler. Uh, wanted to know about sort of the uh, um, environment approach. You know, is there a development or a testing or production environments? How, how do these cloud systems deal with those issues so you minimize downtime and, uh, and related issues? Thank you. Well, with regard to host, what they have is they have a staging environment. And what they allow you to do is to build out your application exactly the way you'd like to see it in the staging environment. And then when both uh, the consulting team and the client team are ready, we are able to move everything that's built directly from the consulting, um, from the staging environment directly into a production environment. doesn't mean that development has to stop. We can certainly tweak things the way we need to in the production environment. We can leave the staging behi environment behind, but because cloud applications are so easily replicated, what they allow us to do is to build a sandbox off of the production environment. So the staging environment actually eventually can go away. We build the, uh, the sandbox environment off of the production environment and we can refresh it at any interval that works for us. So it gives a lot of capability, a lot of flexibility, especially when you get into things like modeling and you want to start attaching all sorts of rows and tables to the database. Okay. And I can speak to the intact environment. It works very similar. There's a, a sort of a development or where the, uh, the system is built out. There's a sandbox or test company created, uh, which is really could be your sandbox. It can be refreshed on a periodic basis so that you do have a production environment as well as a testing or development environment. All righty. I don't see any other questions out there. Uh, we'll just give it... Another second, if anyone else has got anything, final questions. All right, there is information on the slide here. If uh, you want to learn a little bit more about host analytics or Intact, uh, feel free to contact Brent Knights and his phone number there and email address is listed and uh, he can definitely help you and answer any questions that you may have about either one of those applications. So with that, on behalf of uh, Sheila, and thank you very much for your time today, Tony and all the other Brits, I want to thank you for joining us at today's webinar, and everyone have a great rest of the day.